Well, good evening, everybody, and you're very welcome to the sixth in the JCU webinar series in the time of COVID. And I would like to start by acknowledging the traditional owners of all the lands in which we meet and uh, pay our respects to their elders past, present and emerging. Delighted tonight to be able to welcome back some of the people that we've had in previous webinars and many thanks to all of you who have submitted dozens of questions that we hope to be able to get through tonight. This is our list of experts who you've met in previous webinars and who will be presenting briefly and then answering your questions. Next slide, please. Before we get underway, just a reminder, please, if you want to ask questions as we go along, use the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. Please don't use the chat. If you have a technical problem, use the chat function and one of the tech team will help you. Otherwise, please use the Q&A function. Thank you. Next slide. Before we get underway, I'd just like to give a big shout out to all our nursing and midwifery, midwifery colleagues. Of course, uh, International Nurses Day today. And we remember in particular, very specially, next slide, it's 200 years since the birth of Florence Nightingale. And as you know, she was absolutely um, pivotal in understanding disease and disease spread because one of her great strengths was maths and statistics. And so without further ado, we will start this evening. What we're going to do is each of our experts is going to briefly talk um, and try and cover some of the questions that we've been sent in. Once we've been around all the panel, we will then have an open panel discussion uh, between themselves and also any questions that you might like to give us. So next slide, please. And over to Robert Norton. Thank you. Robert, you'll need to unmute yourself before you start. Yes, thank you very much, uh, Pidan, and uh, thank you all for, for listening in. Uh, I'd also like to, to acknowledge the work uh, JSU and Pidan have done to bring this together. So I'm just going to quickly go through a few questions that uh, come up uh, periodically, and I'll begin with the, the sort of view that there may be a relationship between altitude sickness and COVID-19. Is there a similarity? I think the term happy hypoxic has been used by some people. So just to summarize, both altitude sickness and, uh, and uh, respiratory distress syndrome in adults, which is what you get with COVID, uh, are non-cardiogenic pulmonary edema. And that's not uh, unusual. So yes, they are the same uh, problem, but the cause of that problem and, and the pathogenesis is, is, quite, is quite different. Uh, the ARDS that you get with COVID and indeed you get with influenza, you might get it with uh, bacterial sepsis, you can get it with a whole host of other things, is basically due to an outpouring of cytokines which lead to uh, leakage into capillary alveoles, alveolar spaces and the filling up of this with fluid and the inability of uh, the lung macrophages to clear that fluid. Uh, whereas in altitude sickness, this is related largely to, as I understand it, and I'm no expert on this, on pulmonary artery pressures uh, and uh, and you do not get that release of cytokines as seen here. Moving on to the next issue that comes up, thromboembolism, is there an increased risk? And the answer to that is yes. Uh, certainly in uh, aspects of this, there is, uh, but it's not unusual. It's seen uh, with a lot of other conditions as well. Uh, what, what happens? is you get activation of, of pathways uh, that are fairly common to multiple viral diseases. Uh, one example would be the hemorrhagic fevers, such as Ebola. You get activation of tissue factor, which leads to DIC. Uh, here, it's somewhat similar, but you do get a more of a thrombotic uh, event. 
as, as you can appreciate, uh, the difference between DIC and thromboembolism is part of a spectrum which can go one way or the other. So, yes, there's an increased risk, and no, it is not unusual. Uh, moving on to risk factors for severe disease, for severe COVID disease. What are they, and is there anything unusual about them? Once again, the same old culprits with a few uh, interesting differences, if you wanted to compare this with influenza. So obesity, hypertension, coronary artery disease, diabetes, you're all familiar with these. Uh, and they are as much risk factors for COVID-19 as they are for influenza A, with a couple of very interesting uh, uh, differences which we might talk about and one is pregnancy. It doesn't seem to be that uh, marked in pregnancy. Those of you who are around in 2009 may remember that influenza, certainly the swine flu, did have significant effects in pregnancy. And the other thing was that uh, influenza A uh, did not show any marked differences, severe influenza A that is, between the, the various age groups. So children were equally likely to get influenza A as uh, adults. Uh, and in fact, in many, many studies, there were quite a few that did very badly. Whereas here, we are not seeing that. So it's mainly the older age groups, and in particular, those with risk factors. That's not to say that young people do not get severe disease. There have been some studies looking at HLA-related uh, severity of disease, and there does appear to be a link. Uh, and HLA, as you know, are the human leukocyte antigens, which we are all, which we all inherit, and which uh, basically uh, seem to prime us for specific diseases. And there is possibly some evidence that this is the case, as it is with so many infectious diseases. Uh, with COVID. Moving on to antibody testing, to do or not to do. Uh, there's been a lot of discussion about this both locally, within the colleges, uh, and within clinicians, in the public, and so on. And basically, we're talking about uh, IgG, IgA, and IgM. <clears throat> and the argument for doing it is that uh, you get a diagnosis uh, or you get some form of epidemiology or you get an idea as to whether or not somebody is in fact has been infected and therefore cannot be infected again. I would argue that it should not be used to diagnose disease. The IgM comes up uh, about five to seven days after uh, the illness, by which time the PCR test would have been positive long before this. IgG comes up generally after about 10 days. The IgA is interesting. They say it has slightly increased sensitivity, but uh, it tends to uh, did disappear after a while, a bit like IgM, therefore it's of limited value. So my personal view on antibody testing, and in particular the market has been flooded with a lot of rapid tests and so on, is that they should only be used in very specific situations and certainly not to diagnose disease. Those situations would be for epidemiology, uh, and once we know whether antibodies actually do protect, which we do not know. So in other words, what we do not know is if you have COVID-19, you get it again. Healthcare workers and infections, why? Why are we seeing reports of these from uh, obviously the UK, the US, and so on? And I suspect it's, and, and a study has looked at this at all healthcare workers, and they've graded healthcare workers into whether they're face-to-face -face or not face-to-face. -face. And as you would expect, the face-to-face -face workers had 
a greater risk. Uh, and I suspect this is all related to the availability and proper wearing of protective personal equipment. Uh, there can be, to my mind, no other uh, reason. Uh, when you stratify them for the same risk factors, certainly older healthcare workers are at greater risk. But apart from that, my, my personal view, and I suspect this is related to uh, the proper wearing of PPE uh, when uh, faced with patients with COVID-19. The problem, of course, is that you do not know that someone has COVID-19 when you first see them. So I agree, that is a problem. Yeah, thank you, Robert. What we might do is leave it there for now and come back to some of your slides. I know that um, both Diana and David are going to talk about some of these que these questions. I know you particularly wanted to sh uh, share this the next slide with us. So, Pamela, can we have a look at does disinfectant work? I thought this was a nice uh, publication in a reputable journal. Uh, I know, however, there's no citation, but I. I particularly enjoy the conclusion. Thank you. Yes, uh, next slide. So, David, we'll just go to you and ask you to, to give a, a few summary points. Thank you. Thank, thanks, Peter Ann. Uh, there have been a, f uh, a couple of uh, large, larger and larger reporting case series reported of women with uh, COVID 19 in pregnancy uh, from single centres or uh, from a, uh, putting together of. of uh, series of patients across different health networks. <clears throat> uh, unlike, <clears throat> as Rob said, in H1N1 uh, pandemics recently and in, in, the, in the far distant past, pregnant women do not appear to be overly represented in the severe uh, infected categories or in the, in the increase in deaths that are often seen in H1N1. Uh, the biggest single centre one is the, um, uh, the Chinese Wuhan reports. Pregnant women in that symptomatic group were about 0.2 to 0.3% of women reported overall who had, the, who had the virus. And mild disease was far, by far the commonest reported severity. But remember, mild disease, these women are still sick. Um, most reports are in the third trimester in uh, uh, symptomatic women, but there have been uh, one large New York hospital reporting the high rates of asymptomatic women uh, presenting for delivery in their unit. It was rough numbers were about one to two percent of women were symptomatic, 13 to 15 percent were asymptomatic. And I think there's controversy and maybe Rob would like to talk about whether asymptomatic women are a risk to uh, shedding the virus to staff or other people. Um, in the studies there seem to be high rates of preterm birth, Operative delivery, the Chinese reports were more than 90% had uh, caesarean sections. Um, but as some more larger studies are coming out, the operative delivery rate seems to be decreasing. Um, and I think a lot of the uh, uh, deliveries were indicated, it's hard to say, the course of uh, COVID being present more so than any other reason. And uh, women in labor seem to have a high rate of abnormalities in fetal monitoring. Uh, it's interesting that vertical transmission is minimal. Uh, studies that are reported viremia seem to have, this virus seems to have a low rate of viremia and in uh, pregnancy, uh, viral uh, presence does not seem to be detected in amniotic fluid, cord blood uh, or lycor um, with some confusing information about serology in, uh, in newborns, but I think the the uh, viral presence seems to be minimal. Remembering though that this, these are all uh, typically infections in the third trimester. And it would be interesting to see what happens if you're infected in the first and second trimester, what happens in the long term, whether there is a significant viral transmission rate to the fetus. Uh, there are protocols, um, uh, antenatal care, labor management, and postnatal care, Queensland Health on their, on their website has a large, uh, uh, useful protocol. A, uh, uh, it's, it's uh, I think, modelled on or there's a complementary large protocol that uh, is very useful to read in the Royal, the, on the Royal College of ONG website. Um, the, we are seeing that impacting our normal work in our 
antenatal wards, labour wards and postnatal care, especially for women being limited to uh, one person for uh, um, intrapartum support. And we're also seeing it in the, uh, in the antenatal and postnatal wards as well. So someone having a, a disaster, a baby that's died a stillbirth, uh, not having their family around them. I think that's causing significant grief for the, the, the woman, her partner and their families. Um, breastfeeding's fine, skin to skin contact is fine. Um, we're not, it's uh, uh, not, not an issue. And just, just a small note, and we're seeing it in, in the wards that uh, not all fever is COVID and not all symptoms of shortness of breath or chest pain uh, uh, in pneumonia, and we should always just remember other causes such as pulmonary embolus. Thanks, Thank Peter. you, Dave. Thanks, Dave. We'll circle back to that in a minute. Brett, I think that's quite a nice segue into you. The next slide, please. I mean, very sad. You have a stillbirth and, and you can't really have, you know, the people that you would normally have around you on, on the ward. That would be very, very difficult, wouldn't it? Really a theme for mental health is that, um, you know, we've missed a lot of the, you know, the tragic effects of, of high numbers of people with COVID, but it's a lot of the secondary uh, things that, that are going to affect mental health. Um, anyway, just a couple of key points, I think. I mean, our system has not been overwhelmed. Um, and so uh, we know that, I mean, there are some studies emerging now from, from overseas, but a lot of the diagnostic criteria for mental health take time. For PTSD, you need symptoms for one month. Um, for uh, post-viral um, syndrome, like chronic fatigue syndrome, uh, you actually need continuous symptoms for four months. So for us, a lot of the research is actually not going to appear uh, for a month or two. Uh, Brett, sorry to interrupt. Um, we've had a couple of people asking, could you speak louder? Is that possible? You are a bit muted. Thank you. Um, that's an unusual quest for me. I usually speak louder, so um, I'll increase. Um, so we're not seeing much in the way of PTSD at the moment, but I think from overseas, a lot of people have had a stressor, um, a near-death experience that will clearly be a major risk factor, and particularly with higher odds, and a higher probability of PTSD. Um, again, we're not seeing you know, the anger and negative affectivity around uh, lack of uh, PPE and, and lack of you know, ventilator capacity. We, don't, we know that in the workplace, uh, anger uh, is related to burnout of health professionals. Uh, we know that it's related to compassion fatigue um, and secondary traumatic stress is related to uh, health practitioner for mental health. And again, at the moment, we're seeing high rates of kind of general anxiety, um, but we're not seeing the kind of things that are in Spain, and Italy, and New York. Uh, so that's all good. Interestingly, the rate of mental health presentations at accident and emergency departments for mental health has not decreased, where people with a lot of other presentations are not presenting at the moment as they were before. Um, so, you know, people are still turning up and, you know, anecdotally, we have um, very credible reports that people are turning up to general pra uh, practice, you know, with uh, with stress and anxiety and you know, some somatic symptoms of stress and sleep disturbance. Um, so that's clearly going to continue. Um, one of the major developments in the last few weeks has been a modelling study from the University of Sydney and the, 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 the Brain and Mind uh, uh, Centre in, in U Sydney. Um, their modelling, I strongly suspect, is based on the, the global financial crisis. And that clearly showed increased suicides uh, after the GFC. They're predicting that um, over and above the 3,000 completed suicides in Australia a year, um, which is you know, a very high mor uh, mortality rate, this might ri rise by, um, you know, by, by up to 1,500 per year. Uh, this is highly you know, troubling to people like me. And, you know, we're going to, I think, have to have some sort of system response to this. So at the moment, we're in a little bit of a pause. Uh, we have, uh, because of the, you know, the great response in Australia so far, not seen a lot of those uh, acute stress responses, and we probably will see uh, more depression, suicide to come. Um, 
Just one thing I didn't mention there is um, you know, worryingly uh, after these kind of events, uh, domestic violence goes up, uh, child abuse notifications goes up. There's, I counted nine papers after the GFC that reported increases in, uh, in you know, traumatic injury in infants and children, traumatic brain injury in infants and children. Uh, that was non-accidental. Um, and also substance abuse uh, rises as well. So, you know, from a mental health point of view, we're a long, long way out of the woods. Uh, and, um, you know, we need to prepare ourselves for issues that are coming. Thank you, Brett. Before I hand over to John, uh, just two questions that have come up, which I think are pertinent at the minute. The first one is, is there any reason to anticipate that there's a sort of a second wave in mental health presentations may be slightly less pronounced than we fear because the current presentations have been sustained, you know, the level of mental health presentations? Um, I think what's happening is um, people who have mental health problems at the moment are continuing to present. Um, what we know from disaster research is that as, as time goes on, people who have never had mental health problems before start to present. It's almost a new cohort. Um, so that's, that's part of the issue. I think that people who generally cope well uh, with time and with adversity, especially with unemployment uh, and financial issues, I think you know, they, you know, there are some people who were copers but will be overwhelmed. Um, and you know that that might surprise family and friends that that people who are seen to be resilient uh, prove not to be in the long run. Thank you, Brett. And I'll, I'll give you a question that we knew were com was coming because we spoke about it beforehand. But I'll, we'll park it until afterwards. And that's about post-viral depression. So do we know anything about the incidents and what's the best management? But before we do that, uh, perhaps we go to the next slide. And John, these curves that we have come to love and to know and to understand. Would you, you were going to give us a few minutes just to kind of update us on that. Yeah, so um, I, uh, in my talk, uh, I talked a lot about the curves and, uh, um, and this was some weeks ago now. So it's pleasing to sort of see that uh, most Australian jurisdictions have consolidated uh, the gains that were achieved. And I think we're all glued to the screen at night to sort of see the daily case counts in Australia, particularly in various jurisdictions. Um, and, uh, and it's now down into getting towards single, uh, single digits per day in Australia. And uh, New Zealand is doing uh, uh, just as well. So I the points I wanted to make there is, is I'm looking here at uh, graphs and you may not be able to make out the countries, but uh, you can sort of see a few countries are really standing out uh, in terms of how well they have flattened the curve. The top one there is China in yellow um, and South Korea uh, below that. And uh, you can see just above Australia is Norway. Norway and Australia have been tracking pretty well um, evenly, but if you sort of look at the figures on a sort of a daily basis, Australia sort of just edged ahead of Norway a little bit there. So just to remind you, this is not a competition, but, um, uh, and all the Australian jurisdictions, the only exception there is a, a little bit of a kick up in, in Victoria, and you're all aware of the uh, outbreak in the meatworks in Victoria. So interesting to sort of see that uh, uh, meatworks are probably second to nursing homes in terms of uh, intensity of, uh, uh, of outbreaks. And John, can I stop you there? And this may be for you and Robert. This is such an interesting point. We have seen the meatworks outbreak in a number of countries. It, do, is there any uh, current evidence as to why that might be the case? Are you aware or, or Robert aware? Well, there's a lot of, um, I mean, a lot of talking heads about uh, what uh, might be going on. I believe that, uh, and I have not uh, gone into Meatworks, but I believe that they are quite cramped. They're very close together. And that's thought to be the major uh, uh, reason. So, um, it, you know, just being cheek to jowl in on the meat line and uh, it's thought to be the main reason. But uh, there could be other factors such as the, the temperature because it's cooler in those factories and uh, maybe the handling of the, the knives and equipment, more stainless steel surfaces. Um, 
But Robert, you got any other ideas there? Robert, you'll have to unmute. Hmm. Not successfully yet. Not successfully unmuting, Robert. No, you're still muted. John, we might keep you going. I'll, I'll keep, I'll, yeah, I'll keep going. Yeah. Okay, okay, no, no, go ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> Thank you. All yeah, right. no, uh, pretty much what John has said. I don't think there are any uh, actual sort of reasons. Mm. So the other uh, interesting uh, thing to, uh, and, and I know there was a question about have we, did we go too early, too aggressively with the, uh, lockdown measures. I think uh, it's very interesting to compare New Zealand, which went for a total lockdown. And I think for a time that they um, were uh, toying with the idea of total eradication um, of that. And they have come very, very close. But uh, uh, I don't think they've been any more successful than places like South Australia, Western Australia and so on, which have had, you know, a couple of weeks of zero cases in the Northern Territory. <laughs> have had a couple of weeks of zero cases so um but i think we've sort of come to the realization that uh, it's not realistic to aim for total eradication so i think uh, premiers all over the country will uh, reiterate that um that, that we can't eradicate the virus it would be naive to think that you could do that uh, australia has several advantages i suppose apart from it's early and fairly aggressive response. It is an island nation. It was closed its borders fairly quickly. It introduced the quarantine. And I think there's a lot of discussion at the moment about uh, in the United Kingdom, they're only just starting to introduce a, a voluntary isolation, not even a quarantine for people coming in from overseas. Um, although one would have to question uh, the, the, the um, reasoning behind even that when there is so much going on in the UK in terms of, uh, of infection. So um, just to, I suppose, give ourselves a collective pat on the back, um, but uh, we've got the advantage now, Australia, of having a look at what other countries are doing in terms of relaxing the measures, and um, which brings me to a sort of a, a point a lot of people talk about a second wave when you uh, relax the measures. Um, I, I think I'd prefer to think of it as a recrudescence maybe of, of infections. The second wave sort of seen was uh, a throwback to the uh, uh, 1917 and 1918 flu where there was a definite second wave of infections, uh, which was seasonal. So that's another big question. Uh, about COVID-19 is whether there will be a seasonal nature and Australia coming into its winter um, uh, and relaxing measures, uh, there will be um, some truths told, I think, about uh, whether or not COVID is, has a seasonal, um, uh, seasonal aspect to it. And uh, the same in the Northern Hemisphere when they come into their summer, if suddenly countries that uh, weren't doing so well start to do very well, then maybe we can uh, start to talk about uh, COVID-19 having a seasonal uh, nature, but that has not yet been proven. It's only by analogy with other respiratory uh, uh, viruses. So you can also see the countries that are not doing so well there uh, with continued upward trajectories. Um, Sweden is an interesting one to look at. They've uh, deliberately not been aggressive with their measures. Um, and uh, but there's a degree of discomfort within Sweden with the number of people that have died. They uh, had a deliberate policy of trying to protect their elderly, but most of the deaths in Sweden have been in nursing homes. Um, and uh, so I think they are uh, doing a bit of soul searching in Sweden about their approach because the other Scandinavian countries are doing uh, so much better. So um, uh, we'll have a we can observe what's happening. I think Korea, the, the gentleman who went to five nightclubs the day that uh, uh, the restrictions were lifted, who would ever have thought that that sort of thing could happen? Um, um, you know, so maybe that will tell us when we open the nightclubs, you get a stamp and you can only go to one nightclub. You can't go to five <laughs> and spread the disease. So, uh, um, the last thing, and we, they, our premiers keep telling us they don't want to take a backward step, and that's fantastic. And just to remind you that our curve was coming down uh, before a lot of the measures were introduced. So we were still having gatherings of 100 odd people and uh, restaurants were still opening when Australia's curve peaked. 
and you're going to hear a lot now about the R value. Um, I kept talking about the R naught value, but it's actually the R effective value. Um, when that value is less than one, um, the uh, the epidemic will the uh, cases won't grow. And uh, we're currently probably around about 0.5, which is uh, a, a much higher, uh, sorry, a much lower level than a lot of other countries. Some of the countries which are only just getting on top of it now are skirting around the R values of uh, about one. So the UK has just reached one, Germany and so on. So they don't have a lot of wriggle room, whereas Australia has a degree of comfort in its R value. So as the re-release measures, they can watch and act. And I think we're doing it doing it very, very well. I've got a great admiration for our public health officials. In yeah, thanks, John. I know you wanted to briefly mention the influenza, uh, which yeah. is wonderful. And then we'll hand over to Diana and then we'll come back to you. Okay, so um, the I, people were asking what is happening with influenza. And this is just from the latest uh, uh, Queensland report of influenza. And you can see that uh, after mid-March, the influenza notifications just tanked completely. Uh, this is... Uh, another indication of how effective our uh, self-isolation and uh, social distancing has been uh, because there's basically no influence at the moment. I'm not rushing out to get influence vaccine until it's widely available. <laughs> Thank you very that. much. Mm. Um, we'll, we'll go to the next slide. And Diana, as you know, we had lots and lots and lots and lots of questions about vaccines and mutations and so on. So over to you for an update, please. Oh, thank you. Well, there are a lot of updates about vaccines and well, not that much about treatments, but a lot about vaccines. So the last time that I talked, there were five vaccines in clinical development and 73 in preclinical development. And now we have eight vaccines that have already moved to clinical development and a hundred in preclinical development. And this is a enormous step for a new virus. Like I, I haven't ever seen so many vaccines develop in four months. So the two vaccines that are in phase two trials, one is from the Beijing Institute of Technology. It's a non-replicating viral vector, the adenovirus that has the same structure as the Ebola vaccine. And the other one is from NIA from the US, it's an RNA vaccine. And the, the other six vaccines, they are doing phase one and phase two trials at the same time. So there are some inactivated virus, RNA vaccines like the Pfizer, and there are some non-replicated vector like the Oxford vaccine that we have here in the news in the last couple of weeks. Also WHO and the Blueprint just put a call a couple of days ago on, online for countries to sign up for a big trial, for a big phase three trial. The aim is to have 100 sites ready. Once, the, once these vaccines complete the phase two trials, the phase three trials, that is the next step, can, can move forward. And the idea is to have 100 sites ready all over the world. So I guess they are already getting ready for the phase three trials. Mm, about treatments, so we have still the solidarity trial. So the Sorry, last time, Diana, yes? just before you go to the treatments, a, a, a question that's come up frequently is that with evidence of some mutation uh, happening to the coronavirus, will these vaccine trials, I mean, what, are you able to comment on the potential efficacy of them or is it just simply too early to tell? Well, the mutations that the virus is having, there are normal mutations for an RNA virus. So they are not significant mutations that might impact the developing of a vaccine. Most of these vaccines are targeting the S protein, that is the structural protein, that is where most of the immune response and the virulence of pathogenicity of the virus is leading to. So we expect that the virus is not going to mutate as the flu virus does, because this is a different virus. This is a coronavirus, and the mutations are the ones expected during a pandemic. So we don't know yet what might happen in a year with the virus, but at least what we have seen now with the virus is that there is no big mutations that might impact, at least for now, the, the vaccines. Thank you. So about the treatments, so as I mentioned, the solidarity trial, so a couple of weeks ago, there were 150 uh, trials ongoing. There are more than 300 already, in, including Africa and Latin America. And there is a still no evidence for any of the treatments to have efficacy against COVID-19. So there is a lot of conflicting data. 
coming from chloroquine, hydroxychloroquine, even remdesivir that has been approved by the FDA in the US has some conflicting uh, evidence about the efficacy, preventing uh, severe outcomes or even mortality. So the conclusion there as three weeks ago is that there is no enough data yet. In the last, last week, monoclonal antibodies were a hot topic. So some specific monoclonal antibodies have been developed against uh, SARS-CoV coronavirus too. So there is an enormous promise as the next big thing against COVID-19. So let's see what happens. There are some specific uh, monoclonal antibodies developed in Germany, in the US, in Israel. So it's been all over the news. And uh, if, if it works, it will be a, 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 the next big thing. And the convalescent plasma, there is no enough evidence yet, like for the sample size, but there is a lack of blood donors. And that's a limitation of the convalescent plasma because we usually struggle getting blood and getting plasma. So having blood donors from people who have already had COVID-19 hasn't been a, an easy task, but, but there, is, there are still some uh, trials going on about that. About the exit strategies, I will, uh, will just add to what John just said. So flattening the curve just gave Australians time to prepare, to prepare the health system, to educate people on the three basic rules of COVID-19, sufficient personal protective equipment for the healthcare workers, safety measures in place for workplaces, schools, aged care facilities, even restaurants or uh, shopping malls, a robust test trace, test, trace and isolate strategy that that's that it's key to be able to, to keep track of the transmission and maybe we'll find a vaccine. So we know more about this disease than three months ago or even a month ago. And that's the importance and that's key with this flattening the curve that it gave us time to understand better what was happening. So now with the step-by-step -step lifting restriction strategies, it has to be evaluated every three to four weeks taking into account the, the incubation period and the serial interval of, of the virus. And then if the trend is sustained, then the plan can move forward. And the success of the new strategies that would allow us to keep the transmission to the minimum, they are going to depend on the population adherence to the four basic rules of COVID-19. That is what I call the new normal. So we have to get used to this. You just have to, well, we should have learned this long time ago. That is that we have to wash our hands often, at least 20 seconds each time. Physically distancing is the new normal. If sick, stay home. Don't go to work, don't go to school, don't do groceries, nothing. You, you just have to stay home. And if there is community transmission and is detected, uh, wear face masks. That would be the, the old recommendation. And the second way, well, it's possible, but it will depend on how much do, do we adhere to the four rules against COVID-19. We have to keep testing, tracing, and isolating. It will depend also on how much transmission is elsewhere, because if the transmission is not controlled in the US, in the UK, and then we open borders, then we are going to have new introductions. So the probability of introduction will depend on how much transmission is all over the globe. Then we have to keep surveillance on airports if we decide to open the borders. As John also mentioned, the effect of the weather. So apparently in the Northern Hemisphere, there is a multiplicative effect in the force of infection of the coronavirus due to the temperature or the, the season. So if the temperature, low humidity is the time for respiratory viruses. So we still have to wait to see what is happening because we've been in summer the, this whole time. Now we have to see what is going to happen with Australia during winter. So I will just say, I, I will make an analogy with a tennis game. So we won the first set and we feel like we already won the game, but we have to go step by step and winning each of the sets at the time. Okay. Thank you, Diana. I really like that analogy. And Pamela, if you'd like to take slides away and then we're just gonna have the panel for now. And perhaps because Diana, you dared to bring up the question and we've already had some questions come up, let's talk about masks, shall we? So I think I'm gonna ask Robert, John, Diana, David to all unmute. Brett, as a psychiatrist, you may have a, a different view about masks, but um, Tell us, so, so there's some specific questions that have come up. 
for example, if in a specific location like Townsville, where we have had no new cases or and no community transmission at all for at least, I think we're probably coming into our third week now of, of new cases that weren't travel related. Do we need to be wearing masks? Is, is, that, is that something that you would recommend? Uh, if even if you've got an ERT, that what is the chances of, of that being COVID? So Robert, maybe we, we might start with you on that one. Uh, thank you. Uh, straight answer would be no, for the very reason that Diana said there's, uh, you know, when there's uh, significant community transmission, then masks may play a part. Even with community transmission, the value of masks is, has always been debated as to what type of mask, uh, how often do you change it, and so on. But a short answer for Townsville, I, uh, given that there's no community transmission, I would not uh, recommend it. So you're muted, Peter Ann, but I'll, I'll say the same for Cairns. But if I was in the United States or the United Kingdom, I would wear a mask. Well, even going out and about, you've got no symptoms, you yourself are well, you would wear a mask. In the US and the UK, yes, because of the community incidence is so high, you just don't know who's, who's uh, got it. But with all the testing we're doing and the knowledge that there is basically at the moment very little or no community transmission, uh, I think that it's um, a, a very, very marginal thing, but it's 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 in the toolkit for uh, lockdown measures. But I think it's probably most countries you've sort of seen the face mask being applied at at the very end of all the other lockdown measures. Yeah, thank you, David. Are you going to uh, fall in line? You're going to take a different view? No, I think I'd agree. <laughs> oh, good. All right. Thank you. I wonder then, um, just a couple of epidemiology questions, and we may not be able to answer these, but a very interesting question. Had there been broader testing criteria early on in Australia, uh, do you think that um, uh, we might have a different view of community prevalence? I'll, I'll kick off. I, I mean, yes, we, we certainly, if we'd had the testing, and we'd had a broader criteria, we would know more about it. But I think it was modulated by the, uh, um, the constraints of the supply of testing that we had at the time. And, uh, and I think they, there had to be a judgment call that the biggest bang for buck was looking, looking at symptomatic people. Uh, and, and even then we could barely keep up with the demand in terms of the testing. But as the testing has ramped up, you, you've noticed that those criteria have got uh, less and less and now they're sort of encouraging people with uh, even the most minor of symptoms and even in some cases asymptomatic people being tested. Yes, Robert, anything you'd add to that? Uh, yes, no, I, I, I'd agree with John completely. There's, you know, the limitations were there to begin with. It would have been nice to test early, trace and isolate, but uh, we didn't have that luxury. Diana, obviously that the sort of ship has sailed on that, but nevertheless, best guess of community transmission within Australia is it's pretty low. Would that be right? Yes, yes. At this point, it's, it's very low. And, and as John mentioned, the testing of every symptomatic cases, even if the symptoms are very uh, mild, they have been tested and the, the proportion of positivity is very low. So that, that says a lot. Like there are some countries, for example, in the US, that the positivity of all the samples are around 10% or 12%. So it means that they are not testing enough. So when we have a positivity of around 1% or lower than 1%, it means that we are testing a lot of people that might have this very sensible case definition, but they do not have COVID-19. So that's also a good indicator. Thank you. And then one final so epidemiological question then is, is the app worth downloading in places like Townsville, you know, um, certainly out west where there hasn't been a single case? Uh, what, what's the value of that, apart from issues around different kinds of phones and so on? Robert, I might handball that one to you, I think. Uh, it's... That's fairly controversial. I can, I can see the point of it, and it's certainly used, as I'm sure you know, in Korea, I believe Singapore, 
uh, there'd be quite a few other countries that would use the app. Uh, I am not sure what value it would be in a community such as ours in North Queensland. Uh, but I'll leave it there because I, I realize this is something that our leaders are promoting. So. Thank you. It we might be, <clears throat> John go download it once there's been an outbreak in Townsville or Cairns. So download it. John, wasn't Cairns a sentinel testing area for Queensland? What was it? So, so the incidents there should give us a really good view. Would that be right or not? Um, I'm not. Uh, I'm not aware of that. Um, I mean, there's a lot of testing that goes on in Cairns, and we've got. Uh, um, we've just ramped up the testing ability, but uh, I don't think there's a deliberate uh, um, policy of, of testing asymptomatic uh, people in Cairns. Thank you. All right, Brett, we're going to circle back to you now, and you've had a little chance to think about post-viral depression and uh, uh, you know the, the incidents and what might be the best management for that. Sure. Um, in, in normal circumstances. Sorry, Brett, you're very muted again. I, I try again. Yeah. I say speak up a lot. Uh, is that better? Is that better? A, a, lit, a little bit. Um, so, in, in normal circumstances, post viral mental health issues run at about 0.2%. Uh, uh, that's what happens year on year. Um, there's not much seasonality about it, by the way. Um, and depression is a symptom, but of course, fatigue is a much more prominent symptom. Uh, so is irritability, concentration problems, muscle aches and pains, um, and, and, and low-grade dysphoria, low-grade mood. Um, what we know is the prognosis of people who have symptoms and make diagnosis. If you have symptoms for four months, then five years later, the majority of people are still actually symptomatic. So it's a condition with a quite a poor prognosis. Um, and uh, the treatments are cognitive behavioral therapy, a graded exercise, maintaining any degree of you know, functionality, keeping people moving and keeping people active, um, really trying to stop secondary impairment. Um, SSRIs, SSRI antidepressants have some role. Um, if the person is really severe, they should come and see an expert. And there are some uh, treatments that might be, uh, you know, that some people seem to find useful, like stimulant medication. Uh, there's some, the literature says some antivirals that, that might be efficacious, but again, the, you know, the research of that is not strong. So it's a real thing. It's not very prevalent. We have no idea what the prevalence will be after COVID. Um, obviously. Um, we don't know if this is more likely to cause it than other viruses. Um, so we'll have to watch that space, but it's, it's a very unpleasant chronic condition with, you know, treatments which are in some respects palliative. Thank you. I wonder if we could talk a little bit about the clinical treatment because, um, and Robert and John, you might you might be in the best position to answer this. There, there has been talk about, um, not controversy, but talk about the use of ventilators and, and when to put people on a ventilator. And luckily in Australia, we haven't had to go through that experience. But you know, you spoke, Robert, earlier about the happy hypoxic and, and um, uh, uh, we are aware that there are people you know, with, with O2 sats at levels that we would never expect anyone to be managing who, who seem to be all right. Uh, do you have any, um, I mean, not they were in hospital, they're being monitored. Do you, do you have any uh, up-to-date uh, evidence so you can tell us about this? Yeah, no, uh, the current thought, as I understand it from our intensivist colleagues, is to uh, minimize the need for intubation but rather to use non-invasive uh, ventilation or nasal prongs in a negatively pressured room, uh, obviously. The poor lung compliance that you see with severe COVID is reminiscent of influenza. So increasing uh, PEEP and so on uh, carries with it its own risks. 
So our intensivists, as I understand it, and I'm obviously not an intensivist, uh, tend to not be too keen to intubate too early, but rather to try non-invasive uh, methods first. Uh, I don't know, John, do you have any comments or? Yeah, I suppose I've been listening to um, um, uh, my colleagues in the US who put out a great podcast called This Week in Virology. And uh, every week uh, there's a clinician, uh, Daniel Griffith, who gets on and gives an update. And he uh, is an intensivist in New York. He talks about uh, the happy hypoxic. He talks about the, uh, uh, the concern that they have that uh, people whose... Um, oxygen saturations were getting down into the high 80s, which they would never sort of normally um, uh, stand by and tolerate. Uh, the, they're, they're letting people have those and, and they're following up these people for to see whether they have hypoxic brain damage. But uh, um, there are people that they're allowing to have that sort of level of oxygenation, obviously with supplemental oxygen, um, who are not saturating very well, but who tend to tolerate it quite well and are not having long-term hypoxic uh, brain damage. Uh, the, um, obviously, they're sort of trying to preserve ventilators a little bit. I heard, you know, in the early days in Italy and uh, New York that, uh, that, they were, that they could ventilate up to four patients with the one ventilator, which is pretty amazing, really, when you think about a ventilator being used uh, with the same sort of settings on... Uh, on, on three or four patients, but uh, I don't. I think they've uh, don't have to do that anymore. But uh, uh, clearly, bad prognostic factor. And the other factor that seems to come out uh, be coming out is that uh, uh, they seem to do quite well with prone ventilation. So uh, lying patients on the front uh, seems to uh, improve the oxygenation very very quickly. Thank you. Um, and, and someone's made a comment, and I think this, this kind of circles back to you, Diana, what you said earlier, with the enormous amounts of data coming out, particularly from the US about the pathophysiology of the disease and its management, it is likely that this will, re will increase our understanding and therefore the way that we in Australia can treat any severe outbreaks. I mean, fingers crossed, we won't have to deal with that, but we will potentially have a less severe course because of the learnings from our colleagues elsewhere. Yes, so, yes, and, and exactly that is what flattening the curve gave to us, that luxury of, well, see what is happening somewhere else. If maybe if the next time that we start having an increased number of, of cases, there is already a treatment or there is more evidence because data is being collected every single day and new trials are starting every day. So flattening the curve gave us that time to understand a little better and treat our patients better or even prevent the disease better to improve the different outcomes. And I suppose one of the, 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 big, the big trick, no, not the trick, the, the challenge for us just now is to manage what seems likely to be a very long time before things like open international borders and that's so on will be possible. And that, that, I think that's going to be very hard for us as Australians. Yes. And well, the thing is that as Australia aim for elimination, because I, I, I completely agree with John, the, the, the term eradication is very extreme. I would say elimination, where you keep your low numbers for a long time. So your health system is able to manage. And well, we have to keep the borders closed at least until the, the viral circulation decreases a little bit more or at least until we have a, a plan B. Like once we open borders, what are we going to do with all the people that are entering? Because the multiple introductions, that's what it might cause a very large second wave or increase the transmission. Like with the borders closed, we are, we are safe. There is no community transmission apparently. There are asymptomatic infections, we, we really don't know. But I, my guess is that as the, positive, the percentage of positive samples is 1%, there is very low circulation. But if we open borders, the new introductions are going to come. Thank you. Mike, get, take, there's one more question and then we'll, we'll do a roundup because I can't believe it's five to eight already. Can we go back uh, to serology? Robert, you spoke about it a little bit earlier. My understanding is that um, the sensitivity and specificity of the tests that are available is mixed and not fantastic. 
um, do you do you do you foresee a role uh, any of you really in um, serology testing in the future looking at community transmission and one of the other questions that came up was say that we had you had a small viral load exposure you had a almost asymptomatic uh, course you didn't really even know that you had it and you now may well have immunity uh, it would it not only it it will only be serology that tells us that would that be right yes but the unanswered question is do you do you actually get immunity or will this be an influenza type scenario where you could have antibodies to the influenza virus generically but you may not have sufficient antibodies to influenza to prevent the next uh, infection and I think that's the key question that, that we will need to answer and I agree that's where serology will have a part to play in epidemiology in the determination of vaccine effectiveness uh, in the determination of whether you are truly susceptible or not I think in the diagnosis of the acute disease I think PCR uh, remains uh, the test of choice. I would not be comfortable relying on serology alone. Thank you, Diana. Anything having, oh, sorry. Yes. Having so, said that, I just wanted to add one thing on the serology for, di uh, for diagnostics and, and just with the case of the, the Cairns laboratory, which they had to close down for two weeks when they made a diagnosis of someone uh, they use serology to um, sorry. They use serology to uh, um, backtrack and and diagnose some cases retrospectively. So it was a very good use of serology in uh, solving that particular puzzle. Thank you, Diana. Yeah. So, for example, the countries that are aiming for herd immunity, the serology is going to be really helpful because they, that's when you can see which is actually the proportion of people that have been infected. And then you can measure over time to see how that is increasing. But so it's more for seroepidemiological studies, or maybe I, there are some countries also that are using serology to follow up the healthcare workers. So as there are some asymptomatic infections, they take like a baseline sample in all the healthcare workers in a specific hospital, and they do follow-ups every month or every two months to see the proportion of asymptomatic infections. But that's pretty much it, not for diagnosis. I completely and, and as Robert says, we don't, we can't call whether that yeah. confers immunity. No. All right, we've got a couple of minutes, so we're going to do a roundup. So, top, you know, top learnings, top anything you want, really, uh, within the bounds of the laws of our country. So, uh, uh, David, shall I start with you, please? Uh, actually. Can I just ask the panel, do you, do you think asymptomatic infected people contribute much to community spread? And are there any groups of people who are asymptomatically infected who we should be testing for? I'm thinking of women in pregnancy, so about to labour, or you're going to have a general anaesthetic for an operation. Do you think there's any value in knowing that you're asymptomatically infected? I suppose I can t I can tackle it because the I, I'm aware of the studies of the pregnant women in uh, in uh, the labour ward in New York, but there was also some studies of homeless shelters showing a very high level of uh, asymptomatic infection there, which uh, which always sort of puzzled me because they, they were sort of a group that you would think would be susceptible to severe disease, but uh, um, very high rates of asymptomatic infection. But uh, going back to the uh, uh, to the point that Diana made about our testing positivity rate of being sort of now about one in a thousand, and this is testing uh, symptomatic people. There's absolutely no reason to believe that uh, um, uh, that there would be a higher rate of infection in asymptomatic people than in symptomatic people. Um, and because we're getting only one in a thousand odd people testing positive now, then uh, you know the rate is going to be no higher in asymptomatic people. So. Uh, uh, I think we can be reassured that there's no widespread um, uh, transmission of the virus amongst asymptomatic uh, people. Robert, anything yep. Yeah, I, I would agree. There are lots of anecdotal reports of asymptomatic spread and so on, but I would agree with John. Uh, I think the numbers, we've, we're in the fortunate position 
of being able to look back on a lot of things and and uh, asymptomatic transmission appears to be a very minor uh, player so far. Thank you. Brett, you have the last word. Oh, good. That's nice. So I want to go back to Diana's um, tennis metaphor. Um, from a mental health point of view, we're hoping this is a three-set game. If this is a five-set championship match, then we're going to have a lot of mental health issues and it's going to be a long struggle. And my second thing is that we need to support um, the current government's uh, move into um, what I would call, you know, economic socialism. I mean, supporting Australians at this time, uh, supporting them financially, uh, is actually a major public health, a major mental health intervention. And I'm very happy to do my part paying off the debt in the next 10 years, because it's, going, it's a major investment uh, in, in our society. So we should all, you know, thoroughly commend our public health uh, our public health physicians, but also at the moment our politicians. And yes, that, I, I agree completely. On that note, thank you again so much for joining us. Thank you to all the people who, who have uh, submitted questions and have listened. And, uh, and we look forward to a catch up maybe when we're in the, uh, the third or fourth set, uh, we, we might get back together. <laughs> good night, everyone. And thank you. Thank Bye. you. Thank good night. You. Right, good night.